Hello, and welcome to Polygraph. Polygraph hopes to shed a clear perspective on cold cases and missing persons using all available factual information. This is purely a passion project, and we welcome you all to join us in the process while we begin this investigation. Prince George's County, Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area, 1971. It's not often in a place where law and order are not only defined, but upheld, an individual lingers, unscathed by the legalities of what they have done. For over 50 years, with little to no insight, investigations, or suspects, a killer roams free, for crimes unpunished, and eight young women had their futures ripped away from them. It wasn't until the early 2000s that the severity of these crimes were brought back to the public eye. For nearly two years, 1971 to 1972, a killer stalked Prince George's County, dumping the bodies of his victims on the site of I-295, leading to the only name we have been able to give to this individual. These are the crimes of the Freeway Phantom. Please note that this investigation has been done independently. The facts presented are only available due to the hard work of some dedicated sleuths. The novel, Tantamount, by Blaine L. Pardo and Victoria R. Hester, and lastly, former Washington, D.C. detective Romaine Jenkins. This case, as well as its details, may have very well been lost for good without the help of Detective Jenkins, who remembered the case from when she was a dispatcher, and once in a position to work on the case, did so, preserving valuable evidence and tying it together. We would like to thank them prior to beginning our own investigation. Also note that due to the lack of critical evidence in this case, we must approach each case individually and with cautious scrutiny. It is also important to remember that this case involves children from the age of 10 to 18, violent crimes, and racial prejudice. If you or anyone you know has information on this case, or that could lead to an arrest, please contact Crime Stoppers immediately. On April 30th, 1971, an unusually warm day according to sources, was all but normal for the residents of Prince George County. The area is quite diverse, and being so close to the capital of the United States, covers multiple different jurisdictions and law enforcement agencies. It was on this day that the police of Prince George's County received a phone call. A truck driver barreling down I-295 came to a stop to stretch their legs. Upon exiting the cab of his vehicle, the driver saw what he assumed was a pile of rubbish laying just off the shoulder. Upon further investigation, he realized that it was not rubbish, but the body of a young woman. She was clothed, minus her shoes. Patrolmen from Prince George's County came to investigate, but were unable to locate anything. Two days went by until another call came in, reporting the same thing the truck driver did two days ago. Law enforcement arrived again looking for a body, but were unable to locate. The witness was then asked to come and help locate the body. Within minutes they were able to find the corpse. This goof, or blunder, or whatever you'd like to call it, was just a small sample of how the next two years would unfold. Police ineptitude and racial prejudice would haunt the case before it even officially started, before police even knew they had a serial killer walking amongst them. Police were able to quickly identify the body as Carol Denise Spinks, 13 years of age, reported missing on April 25, 1971. Carol was one of eight children in the Spinks household and had a twin sister. Carol had been sent to her local store to pick up a few items, but had never returned. She was still wearing the same sweatshirt and gym shorts she had on when she went missing except for her light blue shoes, which are still unaccounted for. An autopsy on Carol revealed that she had been strangled to death and dumped off I-295 within the last two to three days. This means that Carol's body was most likely on the side of the road for under 24 hours before the first witness called into the PG police. Perhaps it could have been within just a few minutes. Very little was done for Carol and her family as far as an investigation goes. The usual interviews were done and several statements given by friends and family members. For two months, Carol's death remained on police radar, but the leads were thin and results even thinner. It wasn't until July 19, 1971 when Carol's case would garner some extra attention, though not for any reason some might suspect. Just under three months from when Carol's lifeless body was discovered on the side of the road, history began to repeat itself. The body of another young girl had been dumped in almost the same location, just 15 feet away. She was quickly identified as Darlenia Johnson, 16, also from Punch George's County. Her remains had been badly decomposed due to the summer heat and humidity. No cause of death was immediately evident. She was found with her clothes on, but just like Carol, the shoes were missing. 
Darlinia had been reported missing almost two weeks earlier, on July 9th. She had been due for a shift at the local rec center, but when she didn't show, her household was notified. Two individuals claimed to be the last witnesses of Darlinia. Each reported the same sighting, but each with a different suspect. One witness said she had been seen with her boyfriend, the other with an unidentified male. Police attempted to follow these leads, but little progress was made to the unidentified male. Darlinia's boyfriend, however, was more than forthcoming and helpful with information for the investigators. Her boyfriend had said they spent the evening together at his residence. When it was time for Darlinia to head to work, he walked her to the bus and kissed her goodbye, not knowing it would be the last time. He was quickly ruled out as a potential suspect due to his interviews and alibi. Within a week of the discovery of Darlinia's body, more bad news began trickling in for the community. Brenda Faye Crockett, just 10 years old, was sent on a mission. Her older sister had given her some money and asked her to walk down the block to retrieve some TV dinners. Just a short walk wouldn't be seen as a big deal for most in the community, and this was not a normal chore for Brenda, as she was still quite young. Brenda never made it to the store, though. A phone call to her house laid that out pretty clear. Brenda had called her house just an hour after leaving and spoke with a younger sister. She told her sister that she had been kidnapped by a white man and she was taken to Virginia. But not to worry, she'd be taking a cab home. The call disconnected quickly, but another came through minutes later. This time it was a family friend who answered, already aware of the danger Brenda was in and demanding answers from the other side of the phone. Brenda was able to tell him she was in Virginia before he heard noises in the background and Brenda saying she had to go. Similar calls, but this time Brenda asked if her mother had seen her. An oddly specific question which might imply the kidnapper knew Brenda's mother and saw her after the abduction. This could be the reason for the call and the attempts to possibly conceal one's identity by saying she was abducted by a white man. Brenda calmly said she had to go and the line disconnected. Eight hours later, fears became reality as Brenda's body was discovered on the side of Route 50 by a hitchhiker. Brenda's body had been discovered quickly so there was lots to gather in terms of evidence. She had been sexually assaulted and then strangled, presumably with the green scarf wrapped around her neck. She had not been wearing shoes when she left her house, but oddly her feet were clean, suggesting she may have been bathed while captive. Even stranger, unmatched green fibers were pulled from most of her clothing, something that would be prominent going forward. This murder was odd in comparison to the other recent murders. Brenda was a child. She did not appear to be older than she was at just 10 years old. The calls, too, seemed to be attempts to mislead and were calculated by the killer in an effort to conceal their identity and question if they had been seen. The community mourned with the Crockett family, a child taken from this world far too soon, in the most horrific manner. They began to demand answers in their community. Why were young women at risk, and what were the police doing to stop this from happening? Weeks-long investigations followed each of the cases, but no evidence or motive seemed to be made clear. A suspect was never named during 1971, and life seemed to be moving on. The press shared the stories, but the police continually downplayed the threat of a serial killer operating in their city. But the string of events was too hard to ignore, and before long he would strike again. The summer months seemed to come and go, with no update into the previous murders, and little to no press coverage since Brenda's death. The heat gave way to cooler temperatures as kids went back to school. By the 1st of October, 12-year-old Nina Moshia Yates had begun to settle into her routine. She was a quiet and kind girl who always said thank you and lived with her father in Congress Heights. The family was celebrating a new baby as her stepmother had just given birth. Nino, as she was affectionately called, was asked by her father to go down to the Safeway just a few minutes down the street. At about 7 p.m. she was given a $5 bill and began the walk. Nino made it to the store. The cashier recalls ringing her out and was familiar with her family and even stated he might have seen her leaving in a blue Volkswagen. Nino's father waited for her to return, but when she didn't, he went out to find her. Her mother was notified that she never returned home and called in to report her missing. At around 8.45 p.m., a 15-year-old hitchhiker spotted what appeared to be a body lying off of Pennsylvania Avenue, just over the border of Maryland. It was that of Nino Moshia Yates. It had been raining off and on that evening, but Nino's body was dry, indicating it had not been there long. It's possible the hitchhiker missed the killer depositing her body by a matter of minutes. Her body was still warm when found, less than 40 minutes passed since the time she was last seen. She was clothed, but it appeared to have been redressed haphazardly, 
most likely by the killer. She had been brutally raped, and several semen samples as well as head hairs were found throughout her various pieces of clothing. In addition, tiny green fibers were found as well. Nino's murder changed the investigation. The Washington Metro Police Department admitted that this case, as well as Brenda Crockett, Darlinia Johnson, and Carol Spinks, were indeed connected. They were murdered by the same person or persons. The press seized this opportunity to dub the killer the Freeway Phantom. Police followed every tiny clue in Nino's case, but little was found or discovered. Just over a month later, on November 5th, 18-year-old Brenda Denise Woodard was out with classmates having dinner. She had boarded a city bus around 10.30 on her way home. Brenda would normally get home around midnight, most nights stopping to see her family in the apartment across from hers. Her classmate had called to see if she made it home, but her roommate said she had not returned yet. Thinking that she was visiting her family, he brushed it off. Around 11.30 p.m., her roommate had called her family and said she had not returned. Something wasn't right. Around 6.45 the next morning, Brenda's mother walked to the bus station to go to a doctor's appointment. After waiting some time, she inquired as to what the holdup was and was informed a body had been found on Route 202. She decided to walk with a friend instead, and as they did, they passed the crime scene. At the moment, she didn't think much of it, but did notice a wig that looked similar to the one her daughter would wear. It stayed on her mind most of the morning until she returned home around 11.45 a.m., where the phone wouldn't stop ringing. A friend asked if she had heard about the woman's body that was found. She hung up the phone, not wanting to hear more. Her husband returned around 1.45 p.m., and with no sign of Brenda, they reported her missing. When in the process of filing a missing persons report, the wardens were shown a picture of a young woman found in Maryland. They were able to confirm that the body was indeed Brenda. Around 4.30 a.m., a rookie patrolman from the local Chevrolet Police Department came across a woman's body. It was here they determined Brenda had been sexually assaulted, and there were also defensive wounds present on the body. Unlike the previous murders, however, Brenda had been stabbed. It would appear she put up quite a fight in resisting her attacker, as there were signs of strangulation along with the stab wounds and several defensive wounds. Green fibers again were present on the body. Additionally, head hairs were found on the body, some being Caucasian, though it is believed that the Caucasian head hairs are possibly crime scene contamination from the investigators on site. Due to the area where the killer operated, it spanned several different jurisdictions, the likes of which included Washington Metro Police Department, Prince George County Police, National Park Police, and even the local Chevrolet Police Department in Brenda's case, which led to disputes over who was in charge and could be the cause for such contamination as there were lots of parties involved. There was one other stark difference in Brenda's murder that differed from the previous murders. A note had been found in her jacket pocket. This was by far the biggest piece of evidence that the authorities had at this point. It read, This is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me. If you can. Signed, The Freeway Phantom. The killer attempts to speak directly to the police, using the moniker given to him by the media. The note appeared to be written by Brenda herself, and was confirmed by matching it to her other samples of handwriting though it didn't show any signs of nervousness or distress. It was either dictated or copied from another sample of the same writing by the killer himself. Within days, the articles from various press publications began trying to warn individuals with the name Denise to be especially careful, though this seemed to be more coincidental than anything. Several of the victims' middle names were Denise, and there was speculation they were targeted specifically for this reason, though there was no certainty in this speculation. Months went by with little to no updates or activity. It seemed perhaps the killer had been thrown off by his last crime. Brenda had fought harder than the others. She resisted, and the killer lost control, something which must have made him nervous, as he had never had much resistance with the others that he resorted to using a knife. One final crime would place the Phantom in the spotlight before he faded into obscurity for decades. Diane Denise Williams was 17 years old, she was headed into her junior year of high school, but she would never be able to graduate. On the morning of September 5, 1972, roughly 10 months since the last strike, a truck driver pulled over on Route 295 to check his equipment when he discovered the body of a young woman a few feet off the highway. He contacted police and an investigation ensued. Diane had been out the night prior, which was not uncommon for her. She tended to go out and walk or use public transportation to get around. 
She was apparently with her boyfriend and presumably taking the bus home when she was attacked. There were signs of sexual assault and semen was present, though her boyfriend did admit to being intimate the night prior, so it could not be determined if it was related to the crime. Once again, however, the victim had been strangled and tiny green fibers were found on her bra. Outrage followed the latest murder, the tight-knit community angered by the lack of resolution or suspects named in the crime. Most said it was a racial issue, as if the young women were white, there would be more done to find the killer and stop anyone else from being hurt, which could have certainly been part of the issue. In the note found on Brenda's body, the Phantom alludes to having more victims, other than the canonical ones connected to the case. Police were quick to assume the suspect was most likely black, and between the ages of 20 to 40 years old. He operated in primarily black neighborhoods and seemed to be familiar with them as well. It was assumed that if the culprit was a white male, he would have stuck out and would be more detectable or identifiable. There is also the connection to Brenda Cockett's family as she was presumably forced to call home and see if they had been identified by her mother after her abduction. This could point towards the suspect being familiar with the family and even being able to convince Brenda to get into their vehicle, perhaps a family friend, a coworker, or a neighbor, as Brenda's tone did not seem panicked or scared. There is also the mention of having Brenda say she was abducted by a white man and taken to Virginia. While not too far out of the way from the DC area, this is a clear attempt at diversion as the suspect was clearly nervous he had been made in his abduction and wanted to throw the family off of his trail. The green fibers, police presume, came from the interior of the suspect's car, perhaps the seats or headliner, though attempts to match the fibers to make some models were unsuccessful. However, they did seem to match fibers from mass-produced bathroom mats and combined with the cleaning of the victim's feet in several cases could make sense if they were forced to bathe or washed after the crime. This also makes sense as most of the bodies were redressed improperly or haphazardly, as if they did not dress themselves. So the police took this information and tried to make sense of it all. There was DNA evidence, a significant amount from several different crimes. Semen, head hairs, and pubic hairs found on most of the bodies. Possibly blood found on Brenda Woodward belonged to the killer as well, but in the 70s, the world was still a decade away from any form of advancement in DNA technology, so it was not much to go off of. The note found on Brenda Woodard's body, however, was the only piece of information police could effectively use. They honed in on the word tantamount, an uncommon word to use as well as the grammatical errors in the note itself, but not much else was able to be discerned from the note. Hotlines were set up for the public to report tips, and while they were busy in the wake of the murders, they began to steadily decline as the months went on, little to no useful information being provided. Several tips of suspects that never panned out. Several calls indicated dirty cops being responsible for the murders, and there was some reason to believe this. Angela Denise Barnes was murdered in Duncan Waldorf, Maryland in 1971. She was 14 years old and originally connected to the case. In 1974, two ex-cops were found guilty of her death and it was determined her case was not connected with the phantom killings, and nor were the convicted ex-cops. The work was being done on a local gang in the area possibly being connected to the crimes. The Green Vega Gang, as they were known, came into the spotlight as part of the murders. The gang was affiliated with several rapes and abductions in the DC metro area. It was the gang's MO to drive around and offer rides to young women waiting for public transit. The supposed ringleader would appear calm and perhaps even interested in the young ladies. Once they would get into his vehicle, he would pick up another member of the gang where they would go to a location and rape the victims. As the name suggests, the car used by the gang was a green Chevy Vega. Several young women were able to identify members of the gang as well as the car, and their MO had the police intrigued. One member of the gang was able to provide information into the killing of Carol Spinks, which would have only been known to the police and the killer, which was determined to be accurate. While this member of the gang, Warren Morris, denied any involvement with the killings, he pointed to the brains of the operation, John Davis, as the one responsible. Morris did lots of talking and implicated the gang in several dozen rapes and several of the Freeway Phantom murders, but was able to negotiate a deal with the district attorney to avoid any charges associated with the crime. However, a local politician coming up for re-election stated they had a break in the Phantom case and it was due to the help of an inmate at Lorton Prison. Word of this got back to John Davis, who was in custody elsewhere and able to put the pieces together, and wrote a letter to Morris, furious he was implicating him in the freeway crimes. Once the word got out, Morris stopped assisting with any investigation into the freeway cases, as well as the Green Vega investigation. Morris Warren is still in prison to this day, charged on several rape and abductions, as well as several robberies. He claims no involvement in the freeway phantom case. 
Police were unable to tie the gang to any of the cases, and Morris's statements about the murder of Carol Spink seemed to just be coincidental or just a lucky guess. The only other suspect who is heavily considered to be the freeway phantom is a one Robert Askins. Robert was a young man who grew up in the DC area. Not much is known about his early life, however he was reported to be fairly normal until a bicycle accident resulted in head trauma. It was only after this his behavior began to change. In 1938, at just 19, and a student at Miner's Teacher College, he committed his first recordable crime. He invited five young women, all sex workers, to share a drink at a local brothel. He poured each a glass and laced them with cyanide, then promised money to whoever could drink it the fastest. 31-year-old Ruth McDonald drank it all, resulting in her death. The other women all reported that the drink tasted too strange and were cautious due to Aston's behavior, seemingly too anxious to have everyone drink as fast as they could. Just two days later, he engaged another sex worker at the same brothel, 26-year-old Elizabeth Wilson, where he stabbed her to death. He was quickly arrested and upon questioning, told police he had contracted a disease from a sex worker and would, quote, kill them all at one time if he could, end quote. Askins' behavior was erratic and violent most of the time, assaulting orderlies while in custody and projecting his hate towards the opposite sex. Askins was also a police informant helping local PD apprehend sex workers. When he went to trial for his crimes, he was deemed criminally insane and sent to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in 1939. He would spend the next 13 years here until his release in March of 1952, now deemed sociable and sane, but it would prove to be a costly mistake. In September of 1952, Laura Maddie Cook was working the streets when she met a man and brought him to the Logan Hotel in the northwest of the city. The front desk man would recall checking the two in, but seeing the man leave a short time later. By mid-morning the next day, the body of Laura Cook was discovered. She had been manually strangled, but due to her profession, the case had little movement or press coverage. In March of 1953, a young lady named Marie Sweeney had met a young man and taken him to the same hotel. After checking into their room, there was an attempt to strangle her, but she managed to escape. The employee at the front desk recognized the man as he fled as the same one who had been with Lara Cook the night of her murder. However, Sweeney never reported this incident so as not to draw attention to her profession. In April of the same year, a patrolman overheard Sweeney talking to a friend about the event and was able to identify a man lingering around the hotel months later matching her description. The man was Robert Askins, and he was pulled in a lineup where he was positively identified. The DA decided he needed to be locked away and reopened the trial of Ruth McDonald again against him as well as the murder of Laura Cook and attempted murder of Marie Sweeney. Due to a lack of evidence in Laura Cook and Marie Sweeney cases, they were not able to indict him on charges. The DA went full force into charging him again with the murder of Ruth McDonald in 1938 instead. The issue of double jeopardy did not apply since he was deemed insane in the first trial and the jury returned a verdict of guilty within two hours. However, Aston's lawyer had an ace up his sleeve. At the time, in Washington, D.C., the statute of limitations deemed a suspect must be charged within five years of the crime, and because it was 16 years after the murder of Ruth McDonald, the U.S. Court of Appeals allowed Askins to walk free again in 1958. There is little to report on Askins after his release in 1958. That is, up until July of 1976, when a young lady, Martinia Stewart, was approached by a man in a green car with a badge, telling her he was the police and needed for questioning. Martinia obliged, but quickly realized that the man was not who he said he was. He brought her to a house where she was raped, sodomized, and tortured. He held her in his house all night until he forced her to bathe, redress, and then let her leave in the morning. She fled the house without looking back and reported the crime as well as the attacker, but little came from the investigation. That is until it happened again in March of 1977, when Gloria McMillan was also approached by a man posing as an officer. She too followed his instructions and once again was brought to a house where she was also assaulted, forced to bathe, and redressed. However, Gloria fought back several times and was able to subdue her assailant by keeping him in for several hours of abuse. She fled the house and woke up in D.C. general, not knowing how she had gotten there. She reported her attack and investigators helped her locate the house she was tortured in. It belonged to Robert Askins, and investigators even had his photo on file, which Gloria positively ID'd as her attacker. Askins immediately denied the accusations, and claimed all evidence against him was planted, just as he had denied every other accusation against him, stating that he, in fact, was the victim. He was brought to trial and found guilty of the assault as well as kidnapping with a minimum of 15 years to life for the rape 
and 10 years for each kidnapping to be served concurrently. News broke of the incidents and the investigators of the Phantom case turned a keen eye on Askins. His house was searched and the backyard of his home dug up, looking for any evidence to tie him to the murders of six young women between 1971 and 1972. Little was found, however, to match him as a suspect to the case, though there were similarities like his obvious hatred towards women, the method of killing being strangulation, and the bathing and redressing of victims. The only piece of substantial evidence tying Askins to the Freeway Phantom case were letters and notes with the word tantamount written upon them. Once again, an uncommon and rarely used word, but not enough to convict an individual, even with such a twisted, nightmarish past. Askins died in prison at 91 years old, maintaining his innocence in all his crimes and never admitting to any wrongdoing. In addition to the Green Vega gang and Robert Askins, the infamous serial killer and former boxer, Samuel Little, has been seen as a potential suspect. Little is available in regards to him being tied to the case as far as evidence, just like the others, it is all circumstantial. Little was a drifter, and has admitted to over 90 murders, with 60 being directly linked to him. He resided in Maryland in the early 70s, and one victim in Maryland has been linked to him, but it is not attributed to the Freeway Phantom murders. Little's MO targeted sex workers most of the time, and without more evidence, it is just speculation based on him being the most prolific serial killer in the U.S. So where does this leave the investigation? Unfortunately, the case could be colder now than it was in the 70s. For one reason or another, all the DNA and forensic evidence has been destroyed by the authorities. It is unknown if this was intentional or by mistake. At the time, investigators on homicide cases would keep their files with them, not stored in an evidence locker or at the police station. What is left are merely photographs, the note left with Brenda Woodard's body, and various files stringed together by the original investigators. Detective Jenkins has worked diligently to compile it as best as possible, and due to DNA evidence not being a reality in the 70s, it is safe to assume it is probably gone. The only direct link to the killer we have is the note itself, which can tell us a fair amount, but in the end is nothing more than a taunt to the authorities. The word tantamount, again, is the defining part of the letter. It is not a word that is commonly used. Tantamount is an adjective, meaning equivalent in seriousness to, virtually the same as. There is also interest in the spelling of freeway in the letter, with a hyphen between free and way. In DC, the interstate isn't called a freeway, and this is more commonly used in the western part of the states. Could the killer be from the west coast? Some online sleuths think the Zodiac killer can be responsible, due to his taunts to police, though once again the MO doesn't match. Could the killer or killers be a police officer? Perhaps that's why the investigations were so stalled and lacking any leads. Perhaps that's why the evidence was destroyed years later. Or perhaps it's all speculation, like much of this case has become. Robert Askins seems to be the best suspect in all of this. His history and hatred towards women is enough to turn a few heads. But he would never even admit to crimes he was clearly responsible for. In that same vein, how did members of the Green Vega gang know information only available to the police and the killer in the murder of Carol Spinks? It is even possible there could be more murders tied to the case as well as suspects not named in this investigation that could have been questioned, but then cleared. In the end, however, we have little to go on, and unless someone comes forward with new information or unknown DNA evidence is located, this case very well may continue to haunt the victims' families and the residents of Prince George's County because the serial killer still roams free.